Chapter Nineteen of the Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The King's Chamber. He found himself in a large room, dimly lighted by a silver lamp that hung from the ceiling. Far at the other end was a great bed, surrounded with dark, heavy curtains. He went softly towards it, his heart beating fast. It was a dreadful thing to be alone in the king's chamber at the dead of night. To gain courage, he had to remind himself of the beautiful princess who had sent him. But when he was about halfway to the bed, a figure appeared from the farther side of it and came towards him with a hand raised warningly. He stood still. The light was dim, and he could distinguish little more than the outline of a young girl. But though the form he saw was much taller than the princess he remembered, he never doubted it was she. For one thing, he knew that most girls would have been frightened to see him there in the dead of the night, but like a true princess and the princess he used to know, she walked straight on to meet him. And as she came, she lowered the hand she had lifted and laid the forefinger of it upon her lips. Nearer and nearer, quite near, Close up to him she came, then stopped, and stood a moment, looking at him. "'You are Curdie,' she said. "'And you are the Princess Irene,' he returned. "'Then we know each other still,' she said, with a sad smile of pleasure. "'You will help me.' "'That I will,' answered Curdie. He did not say, "'If I can,' for he knew that what he was sent to do, that he could do.' "'May I kiss your hand, little princess?' She was only between nine and ten, though indeed she looked several years older, and her eyes almost those of a grown woman, for she had had terrible trouble of late. She held out her hand. "'I am not the little princess any more. I have grown up since I saw you last, Mr. Minor.' The smile which accompanied the words had in it a strange mixture of playfulness and sadness. "'So I see, Miss Princess,' returned Curdie, "'and therefore, being more of a princess, "'you are the more my princess. "'Here I am, sent by your great-great-grandmother "'to be your servant. "'May I ask why you are up so late, Princess?' "'Because my father wakes so frightened, "'and I don't know what he would do "'if he didn't find me by his bedside. "'There, he's waking now.' "'She darted off to the side of the bed "'she had come from,' Curdie stood where he was. A voice altogether unlike what he remembered of the mighty, noble king on his white horse came from the bed, thin, feeble, hollow and husky, and in a tone like that of a petulant child. "'I will not! I will not! I am a king, and I will be a king! I hate you and despise you, and you shall not torture me!' "'Never mind them, father dear,' said the princess. "'I am here, and they shan't touch you. "'They dare not, you know, so long as you defy them. "'They want my crown, darling, "'and I can't give them my crown, can I? "'For what is a king without his crown?' "'They shall never have your crown, my king,' said Irene. "'Here it is, all safe, you see. "'I am watching it for you.' Curdie drew near the bed on the other side. There lay the grand old king. He looked grand still, and twenty years older. His body was pillowed high, his beard descended long and white over the crimson coverlid, and his crown, its diamonds and emeralds gleaming in the twilight of the curtains, lay in front of him, his long, thin old hands folded round the regal, and the ends of his beard straying among the lovely stones. His face was like that of a man who had died fighting nobly, but one thing made it dreadful. His eyes, while they moved about as if searching in this direction and in that, looked more dead than his face. He saw neither his daughter nor his crown. It was the voice of the one and the touch of the other that comforted him. He kept murmuring what seemed words, but was unintelligible to Curdie although, to judge from the look of Irene's face, she learned and concluded from it. By degrees his voice sank away, and the murmuring ceased, 
although still his lips moved. Thus lay the old king on his bed, slumbering with his crown between his hands. On one side of him stood a lovely little maiden with blue eyes and brown hair going a little back from her temples, as if blown by a wind that no one felt but herself. And on the other, a stalwart young miner with his mattock over his shoulder. Stranger sight still was Lena lying along the threshold, only nobody saw her just then. A moment more, and the king's lips ceased to move. His breathing had grown regular and quiet. The princess gave a sigh of relief, and came round to Curdie. "'We can talk a little now,' she said, leading him towards the middle of the room. "'My father will sleep now till the doctor wakes him, to give him his medicine.' It is not really medicine, though, but wine. Nothing but that, the doctor says, could have kept him so long alive. He always comes in the middle of the night to give it to him with his own hands, but it makes me cry to see him waked up when so nicely asleep. What sort of man is your doctor? asked Curdie. Oh, such a dear, good, kind gentleman, replied the princess. He speaks so softly and is so sorry for his dear king. He will be here presently, and you shall see for yourself. You will like him very much. Has your king father been long ill? asked Curdie. A whole year now, she replied. Did you not know? That's how your mother never got the red petticoat my father promised her. The Lord Chancellor told me that not only Gwynstorm, but the whole land was mourning over the illness of the good man. Now Curdie himself had not heard a word of his majesty's illness, and had no ground for believing that a single soul in any place he had visited on his journey had heard of it. Moreover, although mention had been made of his majesty again and again in his hearing since he came to Gwynstorm, never once had he heard an allusion to the state of his health, and now it dawned upon him also that he had never heard the least expression of love to him but just for the time he thought it better to say nothing on either point. "'Does the king wander like this every night?' he asked. "'Every night,' answered Irene, shaking her head mournfully. "'That is why I never go to bed at night. He is better during the day, a little, and then I sleep, in the dressing-room there, to be with him in a moment if he should call me. It is so sad he should have only me, and not my mamma. A princess is nothing to a queen. I wish he would like me, said Curdie, for then I might watch by him at night, and let you go to bed, princess. Don't you know, then, returned Irene, in wonder, how was it you came? Ah, you said my grandmother sent you. But I thought you knew that he wanted you. And again she opened wide her blue stars. Not I, said Curdie, also bewildered, but very glad. He used to be constantly saying, he was not so ill then as he is now, that he wished he had you about him. And I never to know it, said Curdie, with displeasure. The master of the horse told Papa's own secretary that he had written to the minor general to find you and send you up. But the minor general wrote back to the master of the horse, and he told the secretary, and the secretary told my father, that they had searched every mine in the kingdom and could hear nothing of you. My father gave a great sigh, and said he feared the goblins had got you after all, and your father and mother were dead of grief, and he has never mentioned you since, except when wandering. I cried very much, but one of my grandmother's pigeons with its white wing flashed a message to me through the window one day, and then I knew that my curdy wasn't eaten by the goblins, for my grandmother wouldn't have taken care of him one time to let him be eaten the next. Where were you, curdy, that they couldn't find you? We will talk about that another time, when we are not expecting the doctor, said curdy. As he spoke, his eyes fell upon something shining on the table under the lamp. His heart gave a great throb, and he went nearer. Yes. There could be no doubt. It was the same flagon that the butler had filled in the wine cellar. It looks worse and worse, he said to himself, and went back to Irene, where she stood, half dreaming. 
"'When will the doctor be here?' he asked once more, this time hurriedly. The question was answered, not by the princess, but by something which that instant tumbled heavily into the room. Curdie flew towards it in vague terror about Lena. On the floor lay a little round man, puffing and blowing, and uttering incoherent language. Curdie thought of his mattock, and ran and laid it aside. "'Oh, dear Dr. Kelman!' cried the princess, running up and taking hold of his arm. "'I'm so sorry!' She pulled and pulled, but might almost as well have tried to set up a cannon-ball. "'I hope you have not hurt yourself.' "'Not at all, not at all,' said the doctor, trying to smile and to rise both at once, but finding it impossible to do either. "'If he slept on the floor he would be late for breakfast,' said Curdie to himself, and held out his hand to help him. But when he took hold of it, Curdie very nearly let him fall again, for what he held was not even a foot. It was the belly of a creeping thing. He managed, however, to hold both his peace and his grasp, and pulled the doctor roughly on his legs, such as they were. "'Your Royal Highness has rather a thick mat at the door,' said the doctor, patting his palms together. "'I hope my awkwardness may not have startled His Majesty.' While he talked, Curdie went to the door. Lena was not there. The doctor approached the bed. "'And how has my beloved king slept to-night?' he asked. "'No better,' answered Irene, with a mournful shake of her head. "'Ah, oh, that is very well,' returned the doctor, his fall seeming to have muddled either his words or his meaning. "'We must give him his wine, and then he will be better still.' Curdie darted at the flagon, and lifted it high, as if he had expected to find it full, but had found it empty. "'That stupid butler! I heard them say he was drunk!' he cried in a loud whisper, and was gliding from the room. "'Come here with that flagon, you! Page!' cried the doctor. Curdie came a few steps towards him, with the flagon dangling from his hand, heedless of the gushes that fell noiseless on the thick carpet." "'Are you aware, young man,' said the doctor, "'that it is not every wine can do his majesty the benefit "'I intend he should derive from my prescription?' "'Quite aware, sir,' answered Curdie. "'The wine for his majesty's use is in the third cask from the corner.' "'Fly, then,' said the doctor, looking satisfied. "'Curdie stopped outside the curtain, and blew an audible breath. "'No more. "'Up came Lena, noiseless as a shadow.' He showed her the flagon. "'The cellar, Lena. Go,' he said. She galloped away on her soft feet, and Curdie had indeed to fly to keep up with her. Not once did she make even a dubious turn. From the king's gorgeous chamber to the cold cellar they shot. Curdie dashed the wine down the back stair, rinsed the flagon out as he had seen the butler do, filled it from the cask of which he had seen the butler drink, and hastened with it, up again to the king's room. The little doctor took it, poured out a full glass, smelt, but did not taste it, and set it down. Then he leaned over the bed, shouted in the king's ear, blew upon his eyes, and pinched his arm. Curdie thought he saw him run something bright into it. At last the king half woke. The doctor seized the glass, raised his head, poured the wine down his throat, and let his head fall back on the pillow again. Tenderly wiping his beard, and bidding the princess good night in paternal tones, he then took his leave. Curdie would gladly have driven his pick into his head, but that was not in his commission, and he let him go. The little round man looked very carefully to his feet as he crossed the threshold. "'That attentive fellow of a page has removed the mat,' he said to himself, as he walked along the corridor. I must remember him. End of chapter 19 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter 20 of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Counterplotting Curdie was already sufficiently enlightened as to how things were going, to see that he must have the princess of one mind with him, and they must work together. It was clear that amongst those about the king there was a plot against him. For one thing they had agreed in a lie concerning himself, 
and it was plain also that the doctor was working out a design against the health and reason of his majesty, rendering the question of his life a matter of little moment. It was in itself sufficient to justify the worst fears, that the people outside the palace were ignorant of his majesty's condition. He believed those inside it also, the butler accepted, were ignorant of it as well. Doubtless his majesty's counsellors desired to alienate the hearts of his subjects from their sovereign. Curdie's idea was that they intended to kill the king, marry the princess to one of themselves, and found a new dynasty. But whatever their purpose, there was treason in the palace of the worst sort. They were making and keeping the king incapable in order to effect that purpose. The first thing to be seen to, therefore, was— that his majesty should neither eat morsel nor drink drop of anything prepared for him in the palace. Could this have been managed without the princess, Curdie would have preferred leaving her in ignorance of the horrors from which he sought to deliver her. He feared also the danger of her knowledge betraying itself to the evil eyes about her, but it must be risked, and she had always been a wise child. Another thing was clear to him, that with such traitors, no terms of honour were either binding or possible, and that, short of lying, he might use any means to foil them. And he could not doubt that the old princess had sent him expressly to frustrate their plans. While he stood thinking thus with himself, the princess was earnestly watching the king, with looks of childish love and womanly tenderness that went to Curdie's heart. Now and then, with a great fan of peacock feathers, she would fan him very softly, now and then, seeing a cloud beginning to gather upon the sky of his sleeping face, she would climb upon the bed, and bending to his ear, whisper into it, then draw back and watch again, generally to see the cloud disperse. In his deepest slumber the soul of the king lay open to the voice of his child, and that voice had power either to change the aspect of his visions, or, which was better still, to breathe hope into his heart, and courage to endure them. Curdie came near, and softly called her. "'I can't leave Papa just yet,' she returned, in a low voice. "'I will wait,' said Curdie, "'but I want very much to say something.' In a few minutes she came to him, where he stood under the lamp. "'Well, Curdie, what is it?' she said. "'Princess,' he replied, I want to tell you that I have found why your grandmother sent me. Come this way, then, she answered, where I can see the face of my king. Curdie placed a chair for her in the spot she chose, where she would be near enough to mark any slightest change on her father's countenance, yet where their low-voiced talk would not disturb him. There he sat down beside her and told her all the story, how her grandmother had sent her good pigeon for him, and how she had instructed him and sent him there without telling him what he had to do. Then he told her what he had discovered of the state of things generally in Gwynstorm, and specially what he had heard and seen in the palace that night. "'Things are in a bad state enough,' he said in conclusion. "'Lying and selfishness, and inhospitality and dishonesty everywhere. And to crown it all, they speak with disrespect of the good king, and not a man of them knows he is ill.' "'You frighten me dreadfully,' said Irene, trembling. "'You must be brave for your king's sake,' said Curdie. "'Indeed I will,' she replied, and turned a long, loving look upon the beautiful face of her father. "'But what is to be done? And how am I to believe such horrible things of Dr. Kelman?' "'My dear princess,' replied Curdie, "'you know nothing of him but his face and his tongue, and they are both false.' Either you must beware of him, or you must doubt your grandmother and me, for I tell you, by the gift she gave me of testing hands, that this man is a snake. That round body he shows is but the case of a serpent. Perhaps the creature lies there, as in its nest, coiled round and round inside. Horrible, said Irene. Horrible indeed, but we must not try to get rid of horrible things by refusing to look at them and saying they are not there. Is not your beautiful father sleeping better since he had the wine? Yes. Does he always sleep better after having it? She reflected an instant. No. 
"'Always worse till to-night,' she answered. "'Then remember, that was the wine I got him, not what the butler drew. "'Nothing that passes through any hand in the house except yours or mine "'must henceforth, till he is well, reach his majesty's lips.' "'But how, dear Curdie?' said the princess, almost crying. "'That we must contrive,' answered Curdie. "'I know how to take care of the wine, but for his food—' "'Now we must think.' "'He takes hardly any,' said the princess, with a pathetic shake of her little head, which Curdie had almost learned to look for. "'The more need,' he replied, "'there should be no poison in it.' Irene shuddered. "'As soon as he has honest food he will begin to grow better. "'And you must be just as careful with yourself, princess,' Curdie went on, "'for you don't know when they may begin to poison you, too.' "'There's no fear of me. Don't talk about me,' said Irene. "'The good food. How are we to get it, Curdie? That is the whole question.' "'I am thinking hard,' answered Curdie. "'The good food? Let me see. Let me see. Such servants as I saw below are sure to have the best of everything for themselves. I will go and see what I can find on their supper-table.' "'The Chancellor sleeps in the house.' and he and the master of the king's horse always have their supper together in a room off the great hall to the right as you go down the stair said irene i would go with you but i dare not leave my father alas he scarcely ever takes more than a mouthful i can't think how he lives and the very thing he would like and often asks for a bit of bread i can hardly ever get for him Dr. Kelman has forbidden it, and says it is nothing less than poison to him. "'Bread, at least, he shall have,' said Curdie, "'and that, with the honest wine, will do as well as anything, I do believe. "'I will go at once and look for some. "'But I want you to see Lena first, and know her, "'lest, coming upon her by accident at any time, you should be frightened.' "'I should like much to see her,' said the princess.' Warning her not to be startled by her ugliness, he went to the door and called her. She entered, creeping with downcast head and dragging her tail over the floor behind her. Curdie watched the princess as the frightful creature came nearer and nearer. One shudder went from head to foot of her, and next instant she stepped to meet her. Lena dropped flat on the floor and covered her face with her two big paws, it went to the heart of the princess. In a moment she was on her knees beside her, stroking her ugly head and patting her all over. "'Good dog! Dear ugly dog!' she said. Lena whimpered. "'I believe,' said Curdie, "'from what your grandmother told me, that Lena is a woman, and that she was naughty, but is now growing good.' Lena had lifted her head while Irene was caressing her. Now she dropped it again between her paws, but the princess took it in her hands and kissed the forehead betwixt the gold-green eyes. "'Shall I take her with me, or leave her?' asked Curdie. "'Leave her, poor dear,' said Irene, and Curdie, knowing the way now, went without her. He took his way first to the room the princess had spoken of, and there also were the remains of supper, but neither there nor in the kitchen could he find a scrap of plain, wholesome-looking bread." So he returned and told her that, as soon as it was light, he would go into the city for some, and asked her for a handkerchief to tie it in. If he could not bring it himself, he would send it by Lena, who could keep out of sight better than he, and as soon as all was quiet at night, he would come to her again. He also asked her to tell the king that he was in the house. His hope lay in the fact that bakers everywhere go to work early, but it was yet much too early, so he persuaded the princess to lie down, promising to call her if the king should stir. End of chapter 20 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter 21 of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Loaf his majesty slept very quietly. The dawn had grown almost day, and still Curdie lingered, unwilling to disturb the princess. 
At last, however, he called her, and she was in the room in a moment. She had slept, she said, and felt quite fresh. Delighted to find her father still asleep, and so peacefully, she pushed her chair close to the bed, and sat down with her hands in her lap. Curdie got his mattock from where he had hidden it behind a great mirror, and went to the cellar, followed by Lena. They took some breakfast with them as they passed through the hall, and as soon as they had eaten it, went out the back way. At the mouth of the passage, Curdie seized the rope, drew himself up, pushed away the shutter, and entered the dungeon. Then he swung the end of the rope to Lena, and she caught it in her teeth. When her master said, "'Now, Lena!' She gave a great spring, and he ran away with the end of the rope as fast as ever he could. And such a spring had she made, that by the time he had to bear her weight, she was within a few feet of the hole. The instant she got a paw through, she was all through. Apparently their enemies were waiting till hunger should have cowed them, for there was no sign of any attempt having been made to open the door. A blow or two of Curdie's mattock drove the shattered lock clean from it, and telling Lena to wait there till he came back, and let no one in, he walked out into the silent street, and drew the door to behind him. He could hardly believe it was not yet a whole day since he had been thrown in there with his hands tied at his back. Down the town he went, walking in the middle of the street, that, if any one saw him, he might see he was not afraid, and hesitate to rouse an attack on him. As to the dogs, Ever since the death of their two companions, a shadow that looked like a mattock was enough to make them scamper. As soon as he reached the archway of the city gate, he turned to reconnoitre the baker's shop, and, perceiving no sign of movement, waited there watching for the first. After about an hour the door opened, and the baker's man appeared with a pail in his hand. He went to a pump that stood in the street, and, having filled his pail, returned with it into the shop. Curdie stole after him, found the door on the latch, opened it very gently, peeped in, saw nobody, and entered. Remembering perfectly from what shelf the baker's wife had taken the loaf she said was the best, and seeing just one upon it, he seized it, laid the price of it on the counter, and sped softly out and up the street. Once more in the dungeon beside Lena, his first thought was to fasten up the door again, which would have been easy, so many iron fragments of all sorts and sizes lay about. But he bethought himself that, if he left it as it was, and they came to find him, they would conclude at once that they had made their escape by it, and would look no further so as to discover the hole. He therefore merely pushed the door close and left it then once more carefully arranging the earth behind the shutter, so that it should again fall with it, he returned to the cellar. And now he had to convey the loaf to the princess. If he could venture to take it himself, well, if not, he would send Lena. He crept to the door of the servants' hall, and found the sleepers beginning to stir. One said it was time to go to bed, another that he would go to the cellar instead, and have a mug of wine to waken him up, while a third challenged a fourth to give him his revenge at some game or other. "'Oh, hang your losses,' answered his companion. "'You'll soon pick up twice as much about the house, if you but keep your eyes open.' Perceiving there would be risk in attempting to pass through, and reflecting that the porters in the great hall would probably be awake also, Curdie went back to the cellar, took Irene's handkerchief with the loaf in it, tied it round Lena's neck, and told her to take it to the princess. Using every shadow and every shelter, Lena slid through the servants like a shapeless terror through a guilty mind, and so, by corridor and great hall, up the stairs to the king's chamber. Irene trembled a little when she saw her glide soundless in across the silent dusk of the morning that filtered through the heavy drapery of the windows, but she recovered herself at once when she saw the bundle about her neck, for it both assured her of Curdie's safety, and gave her hope of her father's. She untied it with joy, and Lena stole away, silent as she had come. Her joy was the greater that the king had woke up a little while before, and expressed a desire for food. Not that he felt exactly hungry, he said, and yet he wanted something. If only he might have a piece of nice fresh bread— 
Irene had no knife, but with eager hands she broke a great piece from the loaf and poured out a full glass of wine. The king ate and drank, enjoyed the bread and the wine much, and instantly fell asleep again. It was hours before the lazy people brought their breakfast. When it came, Irene crumbled a little about, threw some into the fireplace, and managed to make the tray look just as usual. In the meantime, down below in the cellar, Curdie was lying in the hollow between the upper sides of two of the great casks, the warmest place he could find. Lena was watching. She lay at his feet, across the two casks, and did her best so to arrange her huge tail that it should be a warm coverlid for her master. By and by Dr. Kelman called to see his patient, and now that Irene's eyes were opened, she saw clearly enough that he was both annoyed and puzzled at finding his majesty rather better. He pretended, however, to congratulate him, saying he believed he was quite fit to see the Lord Chamberlain. He wanted his signature to something important. Only he must not strain his mind to understand it, whatever it might be. If his majesty did, he would not be answerable for the consequences. The king said he would see the Lord Chamberlain and the doctor went. Then Irene gave him more bread and wine, and the king ate and drank, and smiled a feeble smile, the first real one she had seen for many a day. He said he felt much better, and would soon be able to take matters into his own hands again. He had a strange, miserable feeling, he said, that things were going terribly wrong, although he could not tell how. Then the princess told him that Curdie was come, and that at night, when all was quiet, for nobody in the palace must know, he would pay his majesty a visit. Her great-great-grandmother had sent him, she said. The king looked strangely upon her, but the strange look passed into a smile clearer than the first, and Irene's heart throbbed with delight. End of chapter 21 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter Twenty Two of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lord Chamberlain. At noon, the Lord Chamberlain appeared with a long, low bow and paper in hand. He stepped softly into the room, greeting His Majesty with every appearance of the profoundest respect and congratulating him on the evident progress he had made. He declared himself sorry to trouble him, but there were certain papers, he said, which required his signature, and therewith drew nearer to the king, who lay looking at him doubtfully. He was a lean, long, yellow man with a small head, bald over the top, and tufted at the back and about the ears. He had a very thin, prominent, hooked nose, and a quantity of loose skin under his chin and about the throat which came craning up out of his neckcloth. His eyes were very small, sharp, and glittering, and looked black as jet. He had hardly enough of a mouth to make a smile with. His left hand held the paper, and the long, skinny fingers of his right, a pen just dipped in ink. But the king, who for weeks had scarcely known what he did, was to-day so much himself as to be aware that he was not quite himself and the moment he saw the paper, he resolved that he would not sign without understanding and approving of it. He requested the Lord Chamberlain, therefore, to read it. His lordship commenced at once, but the difficulties he seemed to encounter, and the fits of stammering that seized him, roused the king's suspicion tenfold. He called the princess. "'I trouble his lordship too much,' he said to her. "'You can read print well, my child.' Let me hear how you can read writing. Take that paper from his lordship's hand, and read it to me from beginning to end, while my lord drinks a glass of my favorite wine, and watches for your blunders. Pardon me, your majesty, said the lord chamberlain, with as much of a smile as he was able to extemporize, but it were a thousand pities to put the attainments of her royal highness to a test altogether too severe. "'Your Majesty can scarcely with justice uh, expect the very organs of her speech "'to prove capable of compassing words so long. 
and to her so unintelligible. I think much of my little princess and her capabilities, returned the king, more and more aroused. Pray, my lord, permit her to try. Consider, your majesty, the thing would be altogether without precedent. It would be to make sport a statecraft, said the lord chamberlain. Perhaps you are right, my lord, answered the king, with more meaning than he intended should be manifest, while to his growing joy he felt new life and power throbbing in heart and brain. So this morning we shall read no farther. I am indeed ill able for business of such weight. Will your majesty please sign your royal name here, said the lord chamberlain, preferring the request as a matter of course, and approaching with the feather end of the pen pointed to a spot where was a great red seal. "'Not to-day, my lord,' replied the king. "'It is of the greatest importance, your majesty,' softly insisted the other. "'I descried no such importance in it,' said the king. "'Your majesty heard but a part, and I can hear no more to-day. "'I trust your majesty has ground enough, in a case of necessity like the present, "'to sign upon the representation of his loyal subject and chamberlain,' "'Or shall I call the Lord Chancellor?' he added, rising. "'There is no need. I have the very highest opinion of your judgment, my lord,' answered the king. "'That is, with respect to means. We might differ as to ends.' The Lord Chamberlain made yet further attempts at persuasion, but they grew feebler and feebler, and he was at last compelled to retire without having gained his object. And well might his annoyance be keen— for that paper was the king's will, drawn up by the attorney-general, nor until they had the king's signature to it was there much use in venturing farther. But his worst sense of discomfiture arose from finding the king with so much capacity left, for the doctor had pledged himself so to weaken his brain that he should be as a child in their hands, incapable of refusing anything requested of him. His lordship began to doubt the doctor's fidelity to the conspiracy." The princess was in high delight. She had not for weeks heard so many words, not to say words of such strength and reason from her father's lips. Day by day he had been growing weaker and more lethargic. He was so much exhausted, however, after this effort, that he asked for another piece of bread and more wine, and fell fast asleep the moment he had taken them. The Lord Chamberlain sent in a rage for Dr. Kelman, he came, and while professing himself unable to understand the symptoms described by his lordship, yet pledged himself again that on the morrow the king should do whatever was required of him. The day went on. When his majesty was awake, the princess read to him, one story-book after another, and whatever she read, the king listened as if he had never heard anything so good before, making out in it the wisest meanings. Every now and then he asked for a piece of bread and a little wine, and every time he ate and drank he slept, and every time he woke he seemed better than the last time. The princess bearing her part, the loaf was eaten up and the flagon emptied before night. The butler took the flagon away and brought it back filled to the brim, but both were thirsty as well as hungry when Curdie came again. Meantime, he and Lena, watching and waking alternately, had plenty of sleep. In the afternoon, peeping from the recess, they saw several of the servants enter hurriedly, one after the other, draw wine, drink it, and steal out. But their business was to take care of the king, not of his cellar, and they let them drink. Also, when the butler came to fill the flagon, they restrained themselves— for the villain's fate was not yet ready for him. He looked terribly frightened, and had brought with him a large candle and a small terrier, which latter, indeed, threatened to be troublesome, for he went roving and sniffing about until he came to the recess where they were. But as soon as he showed himself, Lena opened her jaws so wide and glared at him so horribly that, without even uttering a whimper, he tucked his tail between his legs and ran to his master. He was drawing the wicked wine at the moment, and did not see him, else he would doubtless have run too. When supper-time approached, Curdie took his place at the door into the servants' hall, 
but after a long hour's vain watch he began to fear he should get nothing there was so much idling about as well as coming and going it was hard to bear chiefly from the attractions of a splendid loaf just fresh out of the oven which he longed to secure for the king and princess at length his chance did arrive he pounced upon the loaf and carried it away and soon after got hold of a pie this time however both loaf and pie were missed the cook was called he declared he had provided both one of themselves he said must have carried them away for some friend outside the palace then a housemaid, who had not long been one of them, said she had seen someone like a page running in the direction of the cellar, with something in his hands. Instantly all turned upon the pages, accusing them one after another. All denied, but nobody believed one of them. Where there is no truth, there can be no faith. To the cellar they all set out to look for the missing pie and loaf, Lena heard them coming, as well she might, for they were talking and quarrelling loud, and gave her master warning. They snatched up everything, and got all signs of their presence out at the back door, before the servants entered. When they found nothing, they all turned on the chambermaid, and accused her, not only of lying against the pages, but of having taken the things herself. Their language and behaviour so disgusted Curdie, who could hear a great part of what passed, and he saw the danger of discovery now so much increased, that he began to devise how best at once to rid the palace of the whole pack of them. That, however, would be small gain, so long as the treacherous officers of state continued in it. They must be first dealt with. A thought came to him, and the longer he looked at it, the better he liked it. As soon as the servants were gone, quarrelling and accusing all the way, they returned and finished their supper. Then Curdie, who had long been satisfied that Lena understood almost every word he said, communicated his plan to her, and knew by the wagging of her tail and the flashing of her eyes that she comprehended it. Until they had the king safe through the worst part of the night, however, nothing could be done. They had now merely to go on waiting where they were till the household should be asleep. This waiting and waiting was much the hardest thing Curdie had to do in the whole affair. He took his mattock, and going again into the long passage, lighted a candle-end, and proceeded to examine the rock on all sides. But this was not merely to pass the time. He had a reason for it. When he broke the stone in the street over which the baker fell, its appearance led him to pocket a fragment for further examination— and since then he had satisfied himself that it was the kind of stone in which gold is found, and that the yellow particles in it were pure metal. If such stone existed here in any plenty, he could soon make the king rich and independent of his ill-conditioned subjects. He was therefore now bent on an examination of the rock, nor had he been at it long before he was persuaded that there were large quantities of gold in the half-crystalline white stone, with its veins of opaque white and of green, of which the rock, so far as he had been able to inspect it, seemed almost entirely to consist. Every piece he broke was spotted with particles and little lumps of a lovely greenish yellow, and that was gold. Hitherto he had worked only in silver, but he had read and heard talk and knew therefore about gold. As soon as he had got the king free of rogues and villains, he would have all the best and most honest miners, with his father at the head of them, to work this rock for the king. It was a great delight to him to use his mattock once more. The time went quickly, and when he left the passage to go to the king's chamber, he had already a good heap of fragments behind the broken door. End of chapter 22 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter Twenty Three of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dr. Kelman. As soon as he had reason to hope the way was clear, Curdie ventured softly into the hall, with Lena behind him. There was no one asleep on the bench or floor, but by the fading fire sat a girl weeping. It was the same who had seen him carrying off the food and had been so hardly used for saying so. 
She opened her eyes when he appeared, but did not seem frightened at him. "'I know why you weep,' said Curdie, "'and I am sorry for you.' "'It is hard not to be believed, just because one speaks the truth,' said the girl. "'But that seems reason enough with some people. "'My mother taught me to speak the truth, and took such pains with me "'that I should find it hard to tell a lie, "'though I could invent many a story these servants would believe at once, "'for the truth is a strange thing here.' "'and they don't know it when they see it. "'Show it them, and they all stare as if it were a wicked lie, "'and that with the lie yet warm that has just left their own mouths. "'You are a stranger,' she said, and burst out weeping afresh. "'But the stranger you are to such a place, and such people, the better.' "'I am the person,' said Curdie, "'whom you saw carrying the things from the supper-table.' "'He showed her the loaf.' "'If you can trust, as well as speak the truth, I will trust you. Can you trust me?' She looked at him steadily for a moment. "'I can,' she answered. "'One thing more,' said Curdie. "'Have you courage as well as faith?' "'I think so.' "'Look my dog in the face, and don't cry out. Come here, Lena.' Lena obeyed. The girl looked at her, and laid her hand on her head. "'Now I know you are a true woman,' said Curdie. "'I am come to set things right in this house. "'Not one of the servants knows I am here. "'Will you tell them to-morrow morning that, "'if they do not alter their ways "'and give over drinking and lying and stealing and unkindness, "'they shall every one of them be driven from the palace? "'They will not believe me. "'Most likely. "'But will you give them the chance? "'I will.' "'Then I will be your friend. "'Wait here till I come again.' "'She looked him once more in the face and sat down. "'When he reached the royal chamber, "'he found his majesty awake and very anxiously expecting him. "'He received him with the utmost kindness, "'and at once, as it were, put himself in his hands "'by telling him all he knew concerning the state he was in. "'His voice was feeble, but his eye was clear.' and although now and then his words and thoughts seemed to wander, Curdie could not be certain that the cause of their not being intelligible to him did not lie in himself. The king told him that for some years, ever since his queen's death, he had been losing heart over the wickedness of his people. He had tried hard to make them good, but they got worse and worse. Evil teachers, unknown to him, had crept into the schools, and there was a general decay of truth and right principle, at least in the city, and as that set the example to the nation, it must spread. The main cause of his illness was the despondency with which the degeneration of his people affected him. He could not sleep, and had terrible dreams, while, to his unspeakable shame and distress, he doubted almost everybody. He had striven against his suspicion, but in vain— and his heart was sore, for his courtiers and counsellors were really kind, only he could not think why none of their ladies came near his princess. The whole country was discontented, he heard, and there were signs of gathering storm outside as well as inside his borders. The master of the horse gave him sad news of the insubordination of the army, and his great white horse was dead, they told him, and his sword had lost its temper. It bent double the last time he tried it, only perhaps that was in a dream, and they could not find his shield, and one of his spurs had lost the rowel. Thus the poor king went wandering in a maze of sorrows, some of which were purely imaginary, while others were truer than he understood. He told how thieves came at night, and tried to take his crown, so that he never dared let it out of his hands, even when he slept, and how, every night, an evil demon in the shape of his physician came, and poured poison down his throat. He knew it to be poison, he said, somehow, although it tasted like wine. Here he stopped, faint with the unusual exertion of talking. Curdie seized the flagon and ran to the wine-cellar. In the servants' hall the girl still sat by the fire, waiting for him. As he returned, he told her to follow him, and left her at the chamber door till he should rejoin her. When the king had had a little wine, 
he informed him that he had already discovered certain of his majesty's enemies and one of the worst of them was the doctor for it was no other demon than the doctor himself who had been coming every night and giving him a slow poison so said the king then i have not been suspicious enough for i thought it was but a dream is it possible kelman can be such a wretch who then am i to trust not one in the house except the princess and myself said curdie i will not go to sleep said the king that would be as bad as taking the poison said curdie no no sire you must show your confidence by leaving all the watching to me and doing all the sleeping your majesty can the king smiled a contented smile turned on his side and was presently fast asleep then curdie persuaded the princess also to go to sleep and telling lena to watch went to the housemaid he asked her if she could inform him which of the council slept in the palace and show him their rooms she knew every one of them she said and took him the round of all their doors telling him which slept in each room he then dismissed her and returning to the king's chamber seated himself behind a curtain at the head of the bed on the side farthest from the king he told lena to get under the bed and make no noise about one o'clock the doctor came stealing in he looked round for the princess and seeing no one smiled with satisfaction as he approached the wine where it stood under the lamp having partly filled a glass he took from his pocket a small phial and filled up the glass from it the light fell upon his face from above and curdie saw the snake in it plainly visible he had never beheld such an evil countenance the man hated the king and delighted in doing him wrong with the glass in his hand he drew near the bed set it down and began his usual rude rousing of his majesty not at once succeeding he took a lancet from his pocket and was parting its cover with an involuntary hiss of hate between his closed teeth when curdie stooped and whispered to lena take him by the leg lena she darted noiselessly upon him with a face of horrible consternation he gave his leg one tug to free it the next instant curdie heard the one scrunch with which she crushed the bone like a stick of celery he tumbled on the floor with a yell drag him out lena said curdie lena took him by the collar and dragged him out her master followed to direct her and they left him lying across the lord chamberlain's door where he gave another horrible yell and fainted the king had waked at his first cry and by the time curdie re-entered he had got at his sword where it hung from the centre of the tester had drawn it and was trying to get out of bed but when curdie told him all was well he lay down again as quietly as a child comforted by his mother from a troubled dream curdie went to the door to watch the doctor's yells had roused many but not one had yet ventured to appear bells were rung violently but none were answered and in a minute or two curdie had what he was watching for the door of the lord chamberlain's room opened and pale with hideous terror his lordship peeped out seeing no one he advanced to step into the corridor and tumbled over the doctor curdie ran up and held out his hand he received in it the claw of a bird of prey vulture or eagle he could not tell which his lordship as soon as he was on his legs taking him for one of the pages abused him heartily for not coming sooner and threatened him with dismissal from the king's service for cowardice and neglect he began indeed what bade fair to be a sermon on the duties of a page but catching sight of the man who lay at his door and seeing it was the doctor he fell out upon curdie afresh for standing there doing nothing and ordered him to fetch immediate assistance curdie left him but slipped into the king's chamber, closed and locked the door, and left the rascals to look after each other. Ere long he heard hurrying footsteps, and for a few minutes there was a great muffled tumult of scuffling feet, low voices, and deep groanings. Then all was still again. Irene slept through the hole, so confidently did she rest, knowing Curdie was in her father's room, watching over him. End of chapter 23 Recording by Hannah Mary
Chapter Twenty Four of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prophecy. Curdie sat and watched every motion of the sleeping king. All the night, to his ear, the palace lay as quiet as a nursery of healthful children. At sunrise, he called the princess. How has his majesty slept? were her first words as she entered the room. "'Quite quietly,' answered Curdie. "'That is, since the doctor was got rid of.' "'How did you manage that?' inquired Irene, and Curdie had to tell all about it. "'How terrible!' she said. "'Did it not startle the king dreadfully?' "'It did, rather. I found him getting out of bed, sword in hand.' "'The brave old man!' cried the princess. "'Not so old,' said Curdie, "'as you will soon see.' He went off again in a minute or so, but for a little while he was restless, and once when he lifted his hand it came down on the spikes of his crown, and he half waked. "'But where is the crown?' cried Irene, in sudden terror. "'I stroked his hands,' answered Curdie, and took the crown from them, and ever since he has slept quietly, and again and again smiled in his sleep. "'I have never seen him do that,' said the princess. "'But what have you done with the crown, Curdie?' "'Look,' said Curdie, moving away from the bedside. Irene followed him, and there, in the middle of the floor, she saw a strange sight. Lena lay at full length, fast asleep, her tail stretched out straight behind her, and her forelegs before her. Between the two paws meeting in front of it, her nose just touching it behind, glowed and flashed the crown, like a nest for the hummingbirds of heaven. Irene gazed, and looked up with a smile. "'But what if the thief were to come, and she not to wake?' she said. "'Shall I try her?' And as she spoke, she stooped towards the crown. "'No, no, no,' said Curdie, terrified. "'She would frighten you out of your wits. I would do it to show you, but she would wake your father. You have no conception with what a roar she would spring at my throat. But you shall see how lightly she wakes the moment I speak to her.' Lena, she was on her feet the same instant, with her great tail sticking out straight behind her, just as it had been lying. "'Good dog,' said the princess, and patted her head. Lena wagged her tail solemnly, like the boom of an anchored sloop. Irene took the crown, and laid it where the king would see it when he woke. "'Now, princess,' said Curdie, "'I must leave you for a few minutes. You must bolt the door, please, and not open it to any one.' Away to the cellar he went with Lena, taking care, as they passed through the servants' hall, to get her a good breakfast. In about one minute she had eaten what he gave her, and looked up in his face. It was not more she wanted, but work. So out of the cellar they went through the passage, and Curdie into the dungeon, where he pulled up Lena, opened the door, let her out, and shut it again behind her. As he reached the door of the king's chamber, Lena was flying out of the gate of Gwynstorm as fast as her mighty legs could carry her. "'What's come to the wench?' growled the men-servants, one to another, when the chambermaid appeared among them the next morning. There was something in her face which they could not understand, and did not like. "'Are we all dirt?' they said. "'What are you thinking about? Have you seen yourself in the glass this morning, miss?' She made no answer. "'Do you want to be treated as you deserve, or will you speak, you hussy?' said the first woman-cook. "'I would fain know what right you have to put on a face like that.' "'You won't believe me,' said the girl. "'Of course not. What is it?' "'I must tell you, whether you believe me or not,' she said. "'Of course you must.' "'It is this, then. If you do not repent of your bad ways, you are all going to be punished.' all turned out of the palace together. "'A mighty punishment,' said the butler. "'A good riddance, say I, of the trouble of keeping minxes like you in order. And why, pray, should we be turned out? What have I to repent of now, your holiness?' "'That you know best yourself,' said the girl. "'A pretty piece of insolence! How should I know, forsooth, what a menial like you has got against me?' There are people in this house, oh, I'm not blind to their ways. But every one for himself, say I. Pray, Miss Judgment, 
"'Who gave you such an impertinent message to his majesty's household?' "'One who is come to set things right in the king's house.' "'Right indeed!' cried the butler. But that moment the thought came back to him of the roar he had heard in the cellar, and he turned pale and was silent. The steward took it up next. "'And pray, pretty prophetess,' he said, attempting to chuck her under the chin, "'what have I got to repent of?' "'That you know best yourself,' said the girl. "'You have but to look into your books or your heart.' "'Can you tell me, then, what I have to repent of?' said the groom of the chambers. "'That you know best yourself,' said the girl, once more. "'The person who told me to tell you said the servants of this house had to repent of thieving, and lying, and unkindness, and drinking, and they will be made to repent of them one way, if they don't do it of themselves another.' Then arose a great hubbub, for by this time all the servants in the house were gathered about her, and all talked together in towering indignation. "'Thieving, indeed!' cried one. "'A pretty word in a house where everything is left lying about in a shameless way, tempting poor innocent girls. A house where nobody cares for anything, or has the least respect to the value of property.' "'I suppose you envied me this brooch of mine,' said another. "'There was just a half-sheet of note-paper about it, not a scrap more, in a drawer that's always open in the writing-table in the study. What sort of a place is that for a jewel? Can you call it stealing to take a thing from such a place as that? Nobody cared a straw about it. It might as well have been in the dust-hole. If it had been locked up, then, to be sure.' "'Drinking,' said the chief porter, with a husky laugh, "'and who wouldn't drink when he had a chance?' or who would repent it, except that the drink was gone? Tell me that, Miss Innocence. Lying, said a great, coarse footman. I suppose you mean when I told you yesterday you were a pretty girl when you didn't pout. Lying, indeed. Tell us something worth repenting of. Lying is the way of Gwynstorm. You should have heard Jabez lying to the cook last night. He wanted a sweetbread for his pup, and pretended it was for the princess. Ha, ha, ha unkindness i wonder who's unkind going and listening to any stranger against her fellow-servants and then bringing back his wicked words to trouble them said the oldest and worst of the housemaids one of ourselves too come you hypocrite this is all an invention of yours and your young man's to take your revenge on us because we found you out in a lie last night tell true now wasn't it the same that stole the loaf and the pie that sent you with the impudent message as she said this, she stepped up to the housemaid, and gave her, instead of time to answer, a box on the ear that almost threw her down, and whoever could get at her began to push and hustle and pinch and punch her. "'You invite your fate,' she said quietly. They fell furiously upon her, drove her along the hall with kicks and blows, hustled her along the passage, and threw her down the stair to the wine-cellar, then locked the door at the top of it, and went back to their breakfast. In the meantime the king and the princess had had their bread and wine, and the princess, with Curdie's help, had made the room as tidy as she could. They were terribly neglected by the servants. And now Curdie set himself to interest and amuse the king, and prevent him from thinking too much, in order that he might the sooner think the better. Presently, at his majesty's request, he began from the beginning and told everything he could recall of his life, about his father and mother and their cottage on the mountain, of the inside of the mountain and the work there, about the goblins and his adventures with them. When he came to finding the princess and her nurse overtaken by the twilight on the mountain, Irene took up her share of the tale, and told all about herself to that point, and then Curdie took it up again, and so they went on, each fitting in the part that the other did not know, thus keeping the hoop of the story running straight. And the king listened with wondering and delighted ears, astonished to find what he could so ill comprehend, yet fitting so well together from the lips of the two narrators. At last, with the mission given him by the wonderful princess and his consequent adventures, Curdie brought up the whole tale to the present moment. Then a silence fell, and Curdie and Irene thought the king was asleep, but he was far from it. He was thinking about many things. After a long pause, he said, 
now at last my children i am compelled to believe many things i could not and do not yet understand things i used to hear and sometimes see as often as i visited my mother's home once for instance i heard my mother say to her father speaking of me he is a good honest boy but he will be an old man before he understands and my grandfather answered keep up your heart child my mother will look after him i thought often of their words and the many strange things besides i both heard and saw in that house but by degrees because i could not understand them i gave up thinking of them and indeed i had almost forgotten them when you my child talking that day about the queen irene and her pigeons and what you had seen in her garret brought them all back to my mind in a vague mass but now they keep coming back to me one by one every one for itself and i shall just hold my peace and lie here quite still and think about them all till i get well again what he meant they could not quite understand but they saw plainly that already he was better put away my crown he said i am weary of seeing it and have no more any fear of its safety they put it away together withdrew from the bedside and left him in peace End of chapter 24 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter 25 of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE AVENGERS There was nothing now to be dreaded from Dr. Kelman, but it made Curdie anxious as the evening drew near to think that not a soul belonging to the court had been to visit the king or ask how he did that day he feared in some shape or other a more determined assault he had provided himself a place in the room to which he might retreat upon approach and whence he could watch but not once had he had to betake himself to it towards night the king fell asleep curdie thought more and more uneasily of the moment when he must again leave them for a little while Deeper and deeper fell the shadows. No one came to light the lamp. The princess drew her chair close to Curdie. She would rather it were not so dark, she said. She was afraid of something. She could not tell what, nor could she give any reason for her fear, but that all was so dreadfully still. When it had been dark about an hour, Curdie thought Lena might be returned and reflected that the sooner he went, the less danger was there of any assault while he was away. There was more risk of his own presence being discovered, no doubt, but things were now drawing to a crisis, and it must be run. So, telling the princess to lock all the doors of the bedchamber, and let no one in, he took his mattock, and with here a run, and there a halt under cover, gained the door at the head of the cellar stair in safety. To his surprise he found it locked, and the key was gone. There was no time for deliberation. He felt where the lock was, and dealt it a tremendous blow with his mattock. It needed but a second to dash the door open. Someone laid a hand on his arm. "'Who is it?' said Curdie. "'I told you they wouldn't believe me, sir,' said the housemaid. "'I have been here all day.' He took her hand and said, "'You are a good, brave girl.' "'Now come with me, lest your enemies imprison you again.' He took her to the cellar, locked the door, lighted a bit of candle, gave her a little wine, told her to wait there till he came, and went out the back way. Swiftly he swung himself up into the dungeon. Lena had done her part. The place was swarming with creatures, animal forms wilder and more grotesque than ever ramped in nightmare dream. Close by the hole, waiting his coming— her green eyes piercing the gulf below, Lena had but just laid herself down when he appeared. All about the vault and up the slope of the rubbish heap lay and stood and squatted the forty-nine whose friendship Lena had conquered in the wood. They all came crowding about Curdie. He must get them into the cellar as quickly as ever he could, 
but when he looked at the size of some of them he feared it would be a long business to enlarge the hole sufficiently to let them through. At it he rushed, hitting vigorously at its edge with his mattock. At the very first blow came a splash from the water beneath, but ere he could heave a third, a creature like a taper, only that the grasping point of its proboscis was hard as the steel of Curdie's hammer, pushed him gently aside, making room for another creature, with a head like a great club, which it began banging upon the floor with terrible force and noise. After about a minute of this battery, the taper came up again, shoved club-head aside, and putting its own head into the hole, began gnawing at the sides of it with the finger of its nose, in such a fashion that the fragments fell in a continuous gravelly shower into the water. In a few minutes the opening was large enough for the biggest creature amongst them to get through it. Next came the difficulty of letting them down. Some were quite light, but the half of them were too heavy for the rope, not to say for his arms. The creatures themselves seemed to be puzzling where or how they were to go. One after another of them came up, looked down through the hole, and drew back. Curdie thought if he let Lena down, perhaps that would suggest something. Possibly they did not see the opening on the other side. He did so, and Lena stood, lighting up the entrance of the passage with her gleaming eyes. One by one the creatures looked down again, and one by one they drew back, each standing aside to glance at the next, as if to say, "'Now you have a look.' At last it came to the turn of the serpent with the long body, the four short legs behind, and the little wings before. No sooner had he poked his head through than he poked it farther through, and farther, and farther yet, until there was little more than his legs left in the dungeon. By that time he had got his head and neck well into the passage beside Lena. Then his legs gave a great waddle and spring, and he tumbled himself, far as there was betwixt them, heels overhead into the passage. "'That is all very well for you, Mr. Legserpent,' thought Curdie to himself. "'But what is to be done with the rest?' He had hardly time to think it, however, before the creature's head appeared again through the floor. He caught hold of the bar of iron to which Curdie's rope was tied, and settling it securely across the narrowest part of the irregular opening, held fast to it with his teeth. It was plain to Curdie, from the universal hardness amongst them, that they must all, at one time or another, have been creatures of the mines. He saw at once what this one was after. He had planted his feet firmly upon the floor of the passage, and stretched his long body up and across the chasm to serve as a bridge for the rest. He mounted instantly upon his neck, threw his arms round him as far as they would go, and slid down in ease and safety, the bridge just bending a little as his weight glided over it. But he thought some of the creatures would try his teeth. One by one the oddities followed, and slid down in safety. When they seemed to be all landed, he counted them. There were but forty-eight. Up the rope again he went, and found one which had been afraid to trust himself to the bridge, and no wonder, for he had neither legs nor head nor arms nor tail. He was just a round thing, about a foot in diameter, with a nose and mouth and eyes on one side of the ball. He had made his journey by rolling as swiftly as the fleetest of them could run. The back of the leg-serpent not being flat, he could not quite trust himself to roll straight and not drop into the gulf. Curdie took him in his arms, and the moment he looked down through the hole, the bridge made itself again, and he slid into the passage in safety, with ball-body in his bosom. He ran first to the cellar, to warn the girl not to be frightened at the avengers of wickedness. Then he called to Lena to bring in her friends. One after another they came trooping in, till the cellar seemed full of them. The housemaid regarded them without fear. "'Sir,' she said, "'there is one of the pages I don't take to be a bad fellow.' "'Then keep him near you,' said Curdie. "'And now can you show me a way to the king's chamber, not through the servants' hall?' "'There is a way through the chamber of the colonel of the guard,' she answered. "'But he is ill and in bed.' "'Take me that way,' said Curdie. By many ups and downs and windings and turnings she brought him to a dimly lighted room, where lay an elderly man asleep. 
His arm was outside the coverlid, and Curdie gave his hand a hurried grasp as he went by. His heart beat for joy, for he had found a good, honest human hand. "'I suppose that is why he is ill,' he said to himself. It was now close upon supper-time, and when the girl stopped at the door of the king's chamber, he told her to go and give the servants one warning more. "'Say the messenger sent you,' he said. "'I will be with you very soon.' The king was still asleep. Curdie talked to the princess for a few minutes, told her not to be frightened whatever noises she heard, only to keep her door locked till he came, and left her. End of chapter 25 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter 26 of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE VENGEANCE By the time the girl reached the servants' hall, they were seated at supper. A loud, confused exclamation arose when she entered. No one made room for her. All stared with unfriendly eyes. A page, who entered the next minute by another door, came to her side. "'Where do you come from, hussy?' shouted the butler, and knocked his fist on the table with a loud clang. He had gone to fetch wine, had found the stair-door broken open, and the cellar-door locked, and had turned and fled. Amongst his fellows, however, he had now regained what courage could be called his. "'From the cellar,' she replied, "'the messenger broke open the door, and sent me to you again.' "'The messenger? Pooh! What messenger?' "'The same who sent me before to tell you to repent.' "'What? Will you go fooling it still?' "'Haven't you had enough of it?' cried the butler in a rage, and, starting to his feet, drew near threateningly. "'I must do as I am told,' said the girl. "'Then why don't you do as I tell you, and hold your tongue?' said the butler. "'Who wants your preachments? If anybody here has anything to repent of, isn't that enough, and more than enough for him? But you must come bothering about and stirring up, till not a drop of quiet will settle inside him.' "'You come along with me, young woman. "'We'll see if we can't find a lock somewhere in the house that'll hold you in.' "'Hands off, Mr. Butler,' said the page, and stepped between. "'Oh, ho!' cried the butler, and pointed his fat finger at him. "'That's you, is it, my fine fellow? "'So it's you that's up to her tricks, is it?' The youth did not answer, only stood with flashing eyes fixed on him, until, growing angrier and angrier, but not daring a step nearer, he burst out with rude but quavering authority. "'Leave the house, both of you. Be off, or I'll have Mr. Steward to talk to you. Threaten your masters, indeed. Out of the house with you, and show us the way you tell us of.' Two or three of the footmen got up and ranged themselves behind the butler. "'Don't say I threaten you, Mr. Butler,' expostulated the girl from behind the page. "'The messenger said I was to tell you again.' and give you one chance more. "'Did the messenger mention me in particular?' asked the butler, looking the page unsteadily in the face. "'No, sir,' answered the girl. "'I thought not. I should like to hear him.' "'Then hear him now,' said Curdie, who that moment entered at the opposite corner of the hall. "'I speak of the butler in particular when I say that I know more evil of him than of any of the rest.' He will not let either his own conscience or my messenger speak to him. I therefore now speak myself. I proclaim him a villain and a traitor to his majesty the king. But what better is any one of you who cares only for himself, eats, drinks, takes good money, and gives vile service in return, stealing and wasting the king's property, and making of the palace, which ought to be an example of order and sobriety, a disgrace to the country? For a moment, all stood astonished into silence by this bold speech from a stranger. True, they saw by his mattock over his shoulder that he was nothing but a minor boy. Yet for a moment the truth told notwithstanding. Then a great roaring laugh burst from the biggest of the footmen as he came shouldering his way through the crowd towards Curdie. "'Yes, I'm right,' he cried. "'I thought as much. This messenger—' forsooth, is nothing but a gallows-bird. 
a fellow the city marshal was going to hang, but unfortunately put it off till he should be starved enough to save rope and be throttled with a pack-thread. He broke prison, and here he is preaching. As he spoke, he stretched out his great hand to lay hold of him. Curdie caught it in his left hand, and heaved his mattock with the other. Finding, however, nothing worse than an ox-hoof, he restrained himself, stepped back a pace or two, shifted his mattock to his left hand, and struck him a little smart blow on the shoulder. His arm dropped by his side, he gave a roar, and drew back. His fellows came crowding upon Curdie. One called to the dogs, others swore. The women screamed. The footmen and pages got round him in a half-circle, which he kept from closing by swinging his mattock, and here and there threatening a blow. "'Whoever confesses to having done anything wrong in this house, however small, however great, and means to do better, let him come to this corner of the room,' he cried. None moved but the page, who went towards him skirting the wall. When they caught sight of him the crowd broke into a hiss of derision. "'There, see! Look at the sinner! He confesses! Actually confesses! Come, what was it you stole? The bare-faced hypocrite! There's your sort to set up for reproving other people! Where's the other now?' But the maid had left the room, and they let the page pass, for he looked dangerous to stop. Curdie had just put him betwixt him and the wall, behind the door, when in rushed the butler with the huge kitchen poker, the point of which he had blown red-hot in the fire, followed by the cook with his longest spit. Through the crowd, which scattered right and left before them, they came down upon Curdie. Uttering a shrill whistle, he caught the poker a blow with his mattock, knocking the point to the ground, while the page behind him started forward, and seizing the point of the spit, held on to it with both hands, the cook kicking him furiously. Ere the butler could raise the poker again, or the cook recover the spit, with a roar to terrify the dead, Lena dashed into the room, her eyes flaming like candles. She went straight at the butler. He was down in a moment, and she on the top of him, wagging her tail over him like a lioness. "'Don't kill him, Lena,' said Curdie. "'Oh, Mr. Minor!' cried the butler. "'Put your foot on his mouth, Lena,' said Curdie. "'The truth fear tells is not much better than her lies.' The rest of the creatures now came stalking, rolling, leaping, gliding, hobbling into the room, and each as he came took the next place along the wall, until, solemn and grotesque, all stood ranged, awaiting orders.' and now some of the culprits were stealing to the doors nearest them. Curdie whispered the two creatures next to him. Off went Ballbody, rolling and bounding through the crowd like a spent cannon-shot, and when the foremost reached the door to the corridor, there he lay at the foot of it, grinning. To the other scuttled a scorpion, as big as a huge crab. The rest stood so still that some began to think they were only boys dressed up to look awful— they persuaded themselves they were only another part of the housemaid and page's vengeful contrivance, and their evil spirits began to rise again. Meantime, Curdie had, with a second sharp blow from the hammer of his mattock, disabled the cook, so that he yielded the spit with a groan. He now turned to the avengers. "'Go at them,' he said. The whole nine-and-forty obeyed at once, each for himself— and after his own fashion. A scene of confusion and terror followed. The crowd scattered like a dance of flies. The creatures had been instructed not to hurt much, but to hunt incessantly, until every one had rushed from the house. The women shrieked and ran hither and thither through the hall, pursued each by her own horror, and snapped at by every other in passing. If one threw herself down in hysterical despair, she was instantly poked or clawed or nibbled up again. Though they were quite as frightened at first, the men did not run so fast, and by and by some of them, finding they were only glared at and followed and pushed, began to summon up courage once more, and with courage came impudence. The taper had the big footman in charge. The fellow stood stock still and let the beast come up to him, then put out his finger and playfully patted his nose. The taper gave the nose a little twist, and the finger lay on the floor. 
Then, indeed, the footmen ran, and did more than run, but nobody heeded his cries. Gradually the avengers grew more severe, and the terrors of the imagination were fast yielding to those of sensuous experience, when a page, perceiving one of the doors no longer guarded, sprang at it and ran out. Another and another followed. Not a beast went after, until, one by one, they were every one gone from the hall, and the whole meanie in the kitchen. There they were beginning to congratulate themselves that all was over, when in came the creatures, trooping after them, and the second act of their terror and pain began. They were flung about in all directions, their clothes were torn from them, they were pinched and scratched any and everywhere. Ballbody kept rolling up them and over them, confining his attentions to no one in particular. The scorpion kept grabbing at their legs with his huge pincers. A three-foot centipede kept screwing up their bodies, nipping as he went. Varied as numerous were their woes. Nor was it long before the last of them had fled from the kitchen to the sculleries. But thither also they were followed, and there again they were hunted about. They were bespattered with the dirt of their own neglect. They were soused in the stinking water that had boiled greens. They were smeared with rancid dripping. Their faces were rubbed in maggots. I dare not tell all that was done to them. At last they got the door into a backyard open, and rushed out. Then first they knew that the wind was howling, and the rain falling in sheets. But there was no rest for them even there. Thither also they were followed by the inexorable avengers, and the only door here was a door out of the palace. Out every soul of them was driven, and left some standing, some lying, some crawling, to the farther buffeting of the water-spouts and whirlwinds ranging every street of the city. The door was flung to behind them, and they heard it locked and bolted and barred against them. End of chapter 26 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter 27 of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. More Vengeance As soon as they were gone, Curdie brought the creatures back to the servants' hall, and told them to eat up everything on the table. It was a sight to see them all standing round it, except such as had to get upon it, eating and drinking, each after its fashion, without a smile or a word, or a glance of fellowship in the act. A very few moments served to make everything eatable vanish, and then Curdie requested them to clean the house, and the page who stood by to assist them. Everyone set about it except Ballbody. He could do nothing at cleaning, for the more he rolled, the more he spread the dirt. Curdie was curious to know what he had been, and how he had come to be such as he was, but he could only conjecture that he was a gluttonous alderman whom nature had treated homeopathically. And now there was such a cleaning and clearing out of neglected places, such a burying and burning of refuse, such a rinsing of jugs, such a swilling of sinks, and such flushing of drains, as would have delighted the eyes of all true housekeepers, and lovers of cleanliness generally. Curdie, meantime, was with the king, telling him all he had done. They had heard a little noise, but not much, for he had told the avengers to repress outcry as much as possible, and they had seen to it that the more anyone cried out, the more he had to cry out upon, while the patient ones they scarcely hurt at all. Having promised his majesty and her royal highness a good breakfast, Curdie now went to finish the business. The courtiers must be dealt with. A few who were the worst, and the leaders of the rest, must be made examples of. The others should be driven from their beds to the street. He found the chiefs of the conspiracy holding a final consultation in the smaller room off the hall. These were the Lord Chamberlain, the Attorney General, the Master of the Horse, and the King's private secretary. The Lord Chancellor and the rest, as foolish as faithless, were but the tools of these. The housemaid had shown him a little closet, opening from a passage behind, where he could overhear all that passed in that room, 
and now Curdy heard enough to understand that they had determined, in the dead of that night, rather in the deepest dark before the morning, to bring a certain company of soldiers into the palace, make away with the king, secure the princess, and announce the sudden death of his majesty, read as his the will they had drawn up, and proceed to govern the country at their ease, and with results. They would at once levy severe taxes, and pick a quarrel with the most powerful of their neighbors. Everything settled, they agreed to retire, and have a few hours' quiet sleep first, all but the secretary, who was to sit up and call them at the proper moment. Curdy stole away, allowed them half an hour to get to bed, and then set about completing his purgation of the palace. First he called Lena, and opened the door of the room where the secretary sat. She crept in, and laid herself down against it. When the secretary, rising to stretch his legs, caught sight of her eyes, he stood frozen with terror. She made neither motion nor sound. Gathering courage, and taking the thing for a spectral illusion, he made a step forward. She showed her other teeth, with a growl neither more than audible, nor less than horrible. The secretary sank fainting into a chair. He was not a brave man, and besides, his conscience had gone over to the enemy, and was sitting against the door by Lena. To the Lord Chamberlain's door next, Curdy conducted the leg serpent, and let him in. Now his lordship had had a bedstead made for himself, sweetly fashioned of rods of silver gilt, Upon it the leg-serpent found him asleep, and under it he crept. But out he came on the other side, and crept over it next, and again under it, and so over it, under it, over it, five or six times, every time leaving a coil of himself behind him, until he had softly folded all his length about the Lord Chamberlain and his bed. This done, he set up his head, looking down with curved neck, right over his lordship's, and began to hiss in his face. He woke in terror unspeakable, and would have started up, but the moment he moved, the leg serpent drew his coils closer and closer still, and drew and drew, until the quaking traitor heard the joints of his bedstead grinding and gnawing. Presently he persuaded himself that it was only a horrid nightmare, and began to struggle with all his strength to throw it off. Thereupon the leg-serpent gave his hooked nose such a bite that his teeth met through it, but it was hardly thicker than the bowl of a spoon, and then the vulture knew that he was in the grasp of his enemy, the snake, and yielded. As soon as he was quiet, the leg-serpent began to untwist and retwist, to uncoil and recoil himself, swinging and swaying, knotting and relaxing himself, with strangest curves and convolutions, always, however, leaving at least one coil around his victim. At last he undid himself entirely, and crept from the bed. Then first the Lord Chamberlain discovered that his tormentor had bent and twisted the bedstead, legs and canopy and all, so about him, that he was shut in a silver cage, out of which it was impossible for him to find a way. Once more, Thinking his enemy was gone, he began to shout for help, but the instant he opened his mouth, his keeper darted at him and bit him, and after three or four such essays, with like result, he lay still. The master of the horse Curdy gave in charge to the taper. When the soldier saw him enter, for he was not yet asleep, he sprang from his bed and flew at him with his sword. But the creature's hide was invulnerable to his blows, and he pecked at his legs with his proboscis until he jumped into bed again, groaning, and covered himself up, after which the taper contented himself with now and then paying a visit to his toes. For the attorney-general, Curdie led to his door a huge spider, about two feet long in the body, which, having made an excellent supper, was full of webbing. The attorney-general had not gone to bed, but sat in a chair asleep before a great mirror. He had been trying the effect of a diamond star which he had that morning taken from the jewel-room. When he woke, he fancied himself paralyzed, every limb, every finger even, was motionless. 
coils and coils of broad spider ribbon bandaged his members to his body and all to the chair in the glass he saw himself wound about under and over and around with slavery infinite and on a footstool yard off sat the spider glaring at him clubhead had mounted guard over the butler where he lay tied hand and foot under the third cask from that cask he had seen the wine run into a great bath and therein he expected to be drowned the doctor with his crushed leg needed no one to guard him and now curdie proceeded to the expulsion of the rest great men or underlings he treated them all alike from room to room over the house he went and sleeping or waking took the man by the hand such was the state to which a year of wicked rule had reduced the moral condition of the court that in it all he found but three with human hands the possessors of these he allowed to dress themselves and depart in peace when they perceived his mission and how he was backed they yielded without dispute then commenced a general hunt to clear the house of the vermin out of their beds and their night clothing out of their rooms gorgeous chambers or garret nooks the creatures hunted them not one was allowed to escape tumult and noise there was little for the fear was too deadly for outcry ferreting them out everywhere following them upstairs and downstairs yielding no instant of repose except upon the way out the avengers persecuted the miscreants until the last of them was shivering outside the palace gates with hardly sense enough left to know where to turn when they set out to look for shelter they found every inn full of the servants expelled before them and not one would yield his place to a superior suddenly levelled with himself most houses refused to admit them on the ground of the wickedness that must have drawn on them such a punishment and not a few would have been left in the streets all night had not durba roused by the vain entreaties at the doors on each side of her cottage opened hers and given up everything to them the lord chancellor was only too glad to share a mattress with a stable boy and steal his bare feet under his jacket in the morning curdie appeared and the outcasts were in terror thinking he had come after them again but he took no notice of them his object was to request durba to go to the palace the king required her services she needed take no trouble about her cottage he said the palace was henceforward her home she was the king's chatelaine over men and maidens of his household and this very morning she must cook his majesty a nice breakfast End of chapter 27 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter 28 of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Preacher Various reports went undulating through the city as to the nature of what had taken place in the palace, the people gathered and stared at the house, eyeing it as if it had sprung up in the night. But it looked sedate enough, remaining closed and silent, like a house that was dead. They saw no one come out or go in. Smoke rose from a chimney or two. There was hardly another sign of life. It was not for some little time generally understood that the highest officers of the crown, as well as the lowest menials of the palace, had been dismissed in disgrace— for who was to recognize a lord chancellor in his nightshirt and what lord chancellor would so attired in the street proclaim his rank and office aloud before it was day most of the courtiers crept down to the river hired boats and betook themselves to their homes or their friends in the country it was assumed in the city that the domestics had been discharged upon a sudden discovery of general and unpardonable peculation for almost everybody being guilty of it himself Petty dishonesty was the crime most easily credited and least easily passed over in Gwynstorm. Now that same day was religion day, and not a few of the clergy, always glad to seize on any passing event to give interest to the dull and monotonic grind of their intellectual machines, made this remarkable one the ground of discourse to their congregations. More especially than the rest, 
the first priest of the great temple, where was the royal pew, judged himself, from his relation to the palace, called upon to improve the occasion, for they talked ever about improvement at Gwynstorm, all the time they were going downhill with a rush. The book which had, of late years, come to be considered the most sacred, was called The Book of Nations, and consisted of proverbs and history traced through custom. From it the first priest chose his text, and his text was, Honesty is the best policy. He was considered a very eloquent man, but I can offer only a few of the larger bones of his sermon. The main proof of the verity of their religion, he said, was that things always went well with those who professed it, and its first fundamental principle, grounded in inborn invariable instinct, was that every one should take care of that one. This was the first duty of man. If every one would but obey this law, number one, then would every one be perfectly cared for, one being always equal to one. But the faculty of care was in excess of need, and all that overflowed, and would otherwise run to waste, ought to be gently turned in the direction of one's neighbour, seeing that this also wrought for the fulfilling of the law, inasmuch as the reaction of excess so directed was upon the director of the same, to the comfort, that is, and well-being of the original self. To be just and friendly was to build the warmest and safest of all nests, and to be kind and loving was to line it with the softest of all furs and feathers, for the one precious, comfort-loving self there to lie, reveling in downiest bliss. One of the laws, therefore, most binding upon men, because of its relation to the first and greatest of all duties, was embodied in the proverb he had just read. And what stronger proof of its wisdom and truth could they desire than the sudden and complete vengeance which had fallen upon those worse than ordinary sinners who had offended against the king's majesty by forgetting that honesty is the best policy? At this point of the discourse the head of the lake serpent rose from the floor of the temple, towering above the pulpit, above the priest, then curving downwards with open mouth slowly descended upon him. Horror froze the sermon-pump. He stared upwards, aghast. The great teeth of the animal closed upon a mouthful of the sacred vestments, and slowly he lifted the preacher from the pulpit, like a handful of linen from a wash-tub, and, on his four solemn stumps, bore him out of the temple, dangling aloft from his jaws. At the back of it he dropped him into the dust-hole among the remnants of a library whose age had destroyed its value in the eyes of the chapter. They found him burrowing in it, a lunatic henceforth, whose madness presented the peculiar feature that in its paroxysms he jabbered sense. Bone-freezing horror pervaded Gwynstorm. If their best and wisest were treated with such contempt, what might not the rest of them look for? Alas for their city, their grandly respectable city, their loftily reasonable city! Where it was all to end, the convenient alone could tell. But something must be done. Hastily assembling, the priests chose a new first priest, and in full conclave unanimously declared and accepted that the king, in his retirement, had, through the practice of the blackest magic, turned the palace into a nest of demons in the midst of them, a grand exorcism was therefore indispensable. In the meantime, the fact came out that the greater part of the courtiers had been dismissed, as well as the servants, and this fact swelled the hope of the party of decency, as they called themselves. Upon it they proceeded to act, and strengthened themselves on all sides. The action of the king's bodyguard remained for a time uncertain, but when at length its officers were satisfied that both the master of the horse and their colonel were missing, they placed themselves under the orders of the first priest. Everyone dated the culmination of the evil from the visit of the miner and his mongrel, and the butchers vowed if they could but get hold of them again they would roast both of them alive. At once they formed themselves into a regiment, and put their dogs in training for attack. Incessant was the talk, innumerable were the suggestions, and great was the deliberation. 
The general consent, however, was that as soon as the priests should have expelled the demons, they would depose the king, and attired in all his regal insignia, shut him in a cage for public show, then choose governors, with the Lord Chancellor at their head, whose first duty should be to remit every possible tax, and the magistrates, by the mouth of the city marshal, required all able-bodied citizens, in order to do their part towards the carrying out of these, and a multitude of other reforms, to be ready to take arms at the first summons. Things needful were prepared as speedily as possible, and a mighty ceremony in the temple, in the market-place, and in front of the palace, was performed for the expulsion of the demons. This over, the leaders retired to arrange an attack upon the palace. But that night events occurred which, proving the failure of their first, induced the abandonment of their second intent. Certain of the prowling order of the community, whose numbers had of late been steadily on the increase, reported frightful things. Demons of indescribable ugliness had been espied careering through the midnight streets and courts. A citizen, some said in the very act of housebreaking, but no one cared to look into trifles at such a crisis, had been seized from behind, he could not see by what, and soused in the river. A well-known receiver of stolen goods had had his shop broken open, and when he came down in the morning had found everything in ruin on the pavement. The wooden image of justice over the door of the city marshal had had the arm that had the sword bitten off. The gluttonous magistrate had been pulled from his bed in the dark, by beings of which he could see nothing but the flaming eyes, and treated to a bath of the turtle soup that had been left simmering by the side of the kitchen fire. Having poured it over him, they put him again into his bed, where he soon learned how a mummy must feel in its cerements. Worst of all, in the market-place was fixed up a paper, with the king's own signature, to the effect that whoever henceforth should show inhospitality to strangers, and should be convicted of the same, should be instantly expelled the city, while a second, in the butcher's quarter, ordained that any dog which henceforward should attack a stranger should be immediately destroyed. It was plain, said the butchers, that the clergy were of no use. They could not exorcise demons. That afternoon, catching sight of a poor old fellow in rags and tatters, quietly walking up the street, they hounded their dogs upon him, and had it not been that the door of Durba's cottage was standing open, and was near enough for him to dart in and shut it ere they reached him, he would have been torn in pieces. And thus things went on for some days. End of chapter 28 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter twenty nine of the Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Barbara. In the meantime, with Durba to minister to his wants, with Curdie to protect him, and Irene to nurse him, the king was getting rapidly stronger. Good food was what he most wanted, and of that, at least of certain kinds of it, there was plentiful store in the palace. Everywhere since the cleansing of the lower regions of it, the air was clean and sweet, and under the honest hands of the one housemaid the king's chamber became a pleasure to his eyes. With such changes it was no wonder if his heart grew lighter as well as his brain clearer. But still evil dreams came and troubled him, the lingering result of the wicked medicines the doctor had given him. Every night, sometimes twice or thrice, he would wake up in terror, and it would be minutes ere he could come to himself. The consequence was that he was always worse in the morning, and had lost to make up during the day. This retarded his recovery greatly. While he slept, Irene or Curdie, one or the other, must still be always by his side. One night, when it was Curdie's turn with the king, he heard a cry somewhere in the house, and as there was no other child, concluded, notwithstanding the distance of her grandmother's room, that it must be Barbara. Fearing something might be wrong, and noting the king's sleep more quiet than usual, he ran to see. He found the child in the middle of the floor, weeping bitterly, and Durba slumbering peacefully in bed. The instant she saw him, the night-lost thing ceased her crying, smiled, 
and stretched out her arms to him. Unwilling to wake the old woman, who had been working hard all day, he took the child and carried her with him. She clung to him so, pressing her tear-wet radiant face against his, that her little arms threatened to choke him. When he re-entered the chamber, he found the king sitting up in bed, fighting the phantoms of some hideous dream. Generally upon such occasions, although he saw his watcher, he could not dissociate him from the dream, and went raving on. But the moment his eyes fell upon little Barbara, whom he had never seen before, his soul came into them with a rush, and a smile like the dawn of an eternal day overspread his countenance. The dream was nowhere, and the child was in his heart. He stretched out his arms to her, the child stretched out hers to him, and in five minutes they were both asleep, each in the other's embrace. From that night Barbara had a crib in the king's chamber, and as often as he woke, Irene or Curdie, whichever was watching, took the sleeping child and laid her in his arms, upon which, invariably and instantly, the dream would vanish. A great part of the day, too, she would be playing on or about the king's bed, and it was a delight to the heart of the princess to see her amusing herself with the crown, now sitting upon it, now rolling it hither and thither about the room like a hoop. Her grandmother, entering once while she was pretending to make porridge in it, held up her hands in horror-struck amazement. But the king would not allow her to interfere, for the king was now Barbara's playmate, and his crown their plaything. The colonel of the guard was also growing better. Curdie went often to see him. They were soon friends, for the best people understand each other the easiest, and the grim old warrior loved the minor boy, as if he were at once his son and his angel. He was very anxious about his regiment. He said the officers were mostly honest men, he believed, but how they might be doing without him, or what they might resolve, in ignorance of the real state of affairs, and exposed to every misrepresentation, who could tell? Curdie proposed that he should send for the major, offering to be the messenger. The colonel agreed, and Curdie went, not without his mattock, because of the dogs. But the officers had been told by the master of the horse that their colonel was dead, and although they were amazed he should be buried without the attendance of his regiment, they never doubted the information. The handwriting itself of their colonel was insufficient, counteracted by the fresh reports daily current to destroy the lie. The major regarded the letter as a trap for the next officer in command, and sent his orderly to arrest the messenger. But Curdie had had the wisdom not to wait for an answer. The king's enemies said that he had first poisoned the good colonel of the guard, and then murdered the master of the horse, and other faithful counsellors, and that his oldest and most attached domestics had but escaped from the palace with their lives, nor all of them, for the butler was missing. Mad or wicked, he was not only unfit to rule any longer, but worse than unfit to have in his power and under his influence the young princess, only hope of Gwynstorm and the kingdom. The moment the Lord Chancellor reached his house in the country, and had got himself clothed, he began to devise how yet to destroy his master, and the very next morning set out for the neighbouring kingdom of Borsagrass to invite invasion, and offer a compact with its monarch. End of chapter 29 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter 30 of The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Peter At the cottage on the mountain, everything for a time went on just as before. It was indeed dull without Curdie, but as often as they looked at the emerald, it was gloriously green, and with nothing to fear or regret, and everything to hope, they required little comforting. One morning, however, at last, Peter, who had been consulting the gem, rather now from habit than anxiety, as a farmer his barometer in undoubtful weather, turned suddenly to his wife, the stone in his hand, and held it up with a look of ghastly dismay. "'Why, that's never the emerald,' said Joan. "'It is,' answered Peter. "'But it were small blame to any one that took it for a bit of bottle-glass.' "'For?' 
all save one spot right in the centre of intensest and most brilliant green it looked as if the colour had been burnt out of it run run peter cried his wife run and tell the old princess it may not be too late the boy must be lying at death's door without a word peter caught up his mattock darted from the cottage and was at the bottom of the hill in less time than he usually took to get halfway. The door of the king's house stood open. He rushed in and up the stair, but after wandering about in vain for an hour, opening door after door, and finding no way farther up, the heart of the old man had well nigh failed him. Empty rooms, empty rooms, desertion and desolation everywhere. At last he did come upon the door to the tower stair. Up he darted, arrived at the top he found three doors and one after the other knocked at them all but there was neither voice nor hearing urged by his faith and his dread slowly hesitatingly he opened one it revealed a bare garret room nothing in it but one chair and one spinning wheel he closed it and opened the next to start back in terror for he saw nothing but a great gulf a moonless night full of stars and for all the stars dark dark a fathomless abyss he opened the third door and a rush like the tide of a living sea invaded his ears multitudinous wings flapped and flashed in the sun and like the ascending column from a volcano white birds innumerable shot into the air darkening the sky with the shadow of their cloud and then with a sharp sweep as if bent sideways by a sudden wind, flew northward, swiftly away, and vanished. The place felt like a tomb. There seemed no breath of life left in it. Despair laid hold upon him. He rushed down, thundering with heavy feet. Out upon him darted the housekeeper like an ogress spider, and after her came her men. But Peter rushed past them, heedless and careless, for had not the princess mocked him, and sped along the road to Gwynstorm. What help lay in a miner's mattock, a man's arm, a father's heart, he would bear to his boy. Joan sat up all night waiting his return, hoping and hoping. The mountain was very still, and the sky was clear. But all night long the miner sped northwards, and the heart of his wife was troubled. End of chapter 30 Recording by Hannah Mary